So I'm not sure what we're going to get to today. I'm not sure if I'm going to do nothing on the table or not. Um, again, this is another day where I was very close to not making any video. But then I was watching my video from last night. And I, I remember bringing up the topic about war games and war game rules. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to kind of do a primer on war games and war game rules. And so I'm going to try to do my best to just kind of give you a miniature Wargaming Rules 101 uh, and just kind of take you through kind of the evolution of Wargame Rules and maybe, maybe suggest to you that instead of going forward, you know, if you really want to get enjoyment out of this hobby, maybe we need to go backwards. So let's start from the beginning. This is the book that primarily is responsible for me being a war gamer and a miniature war gaming uh, player today. Matter of fact, there's no primarily about it. It is this book. Now, I will say primarily this book because for a long time, uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, actually own the book I would literally as a kid have to go to the library and I would either check it out or I would sit there and read it because sometimes I would check it out and when I brought it back they would say well you can't check it out again uh, like till next week and so because they wanted to give other people a chance to check it out which usually nobody ever checked it out like I would come and look at the back where they had a little card and I was the only one checking this book out. But, so I would, some days I would just go to the library and read it. And then other times, it wasn't at my local library. And so I grew up in Detroit. And a lot of times the Detroit libraries did not carry this kind of material. So I would have to go out to the suburban libraries, sometimes on a bus. And, uh... I would read them there because I couldn't check it out. That was before they did a lot of the interlibrary loan programs like you have now with the computer system where you can sometimes get a book from another library system. Uh, although I don't know how that still works, whether it's in the system or if it has to be the same city with just different libraries in the city. But anyway... I would find myself at the library sitting and reading this book. Now, this is by Donald Featherstone. This is called Complete Wargaming. And basically, this is actually one of his later publications. I think this came out, let's just see. It says 1988. This is copyright 1988. Now, that is actually the year... Wow, I graduated from high school in 1986. So, this says down on Featherstone 1988. I don't know if this is a reprint. Like, if this particular one I'm looking at was reprinted in 1988. Or, if maybe I did find this after I had graduated from high school. Because that would explain me being able to get out to uh, some of the suburban libraries to look at it. So, I probably wasn't a kid, quote unquote. Uh... But I was still young, maybe, what, 18, 19, 20. And I can probably tell you, I know for certain that I, I was introduced to some of his earlier books. But so what Donald Featherstone does in this book is he takes a lot of ideals from a lot of his, his different books. And he kind of puts them in this book here. Uh, which is why he calls it complete wargaming. So he kind of talks about, you know, kind of the introductions. He gives uh, kind of a short breakdown of all the different uh, periods you can wargame. So he has uh, tanks in the desert, 30 year wars, commando raids as wargames, uh, Wellington in the peninsula, the Macedonian phalanx. 
incomparable English archers, the American Revolution, and so forth. This book is probably one of his only, if not, I think, his only books that actually has color images on the inside. Most of them will have a color image on the cover, but it's not even like this good an image. But this is one of the few that actually has color pictures on the interior. And I will, sh I will show you what I mean in a second. Now, I will say this. Uh, some of these miniatures actually hold up much better than I remember. Right? Because I was telling you guys about the Elastalin figures. Uh, and how kind of they look a lot real dated now. And... Uh, you know they're not not very interesting looking but that that type of thing holds up uh, now I will show you there there is, there is bound to be some of the figures I was talking about in here which are which are a bit more static uh, so we're gonna go through these sections he's talking about uniforms artillery so almost all of this is dedicated to the Civil War. And I mean, this this is complete with rules, right? So if you buy this, you have rules. You have firing charts. Uh, and back in the day, almost all of your war game rules worked with charts. Which, now that I look back on it, uh, man, I, I will tell you... I think that these these rules make an argument for bringing back charts. I actually uh, wrote a miniature skirmish rule called a fatal blow, man to man combat, and I put a chart in there for resolving combat because you know this is kind of what I got familiar with, and one of the things a chart allows you to do is you can cover a much greater range of possibilities than you can with a D6 or a D10, right? But because of convenience and quickness in play now, everything's resolved with dice rolls, right? And that's kind of all your modern game creators, you look at all their modern games, they reduce everything to dice rolls. Either throw more dice, throw a higher number of a dice, throw the dice and throw the dice again. Right, but back in the day, it wasn't like that, right? So if you had, for example, here, he talks about rifles firing at targets who are in the open, right? You, you it's gonna be a two rifles firing at guns in hard cover. There's a zero and all this. So there was a lot of modifiers and a lot of charts, but it allowed you to better simulate real real combat or real battles because there was some nuance in it nowadays people don't like charts because nobody wants to take the time to look up a chart when the artillery guns are about to fire or to look up a chart when you know a line line infantry are about to fire on each other now in the historical era obviously if you're a historical gamer i'm not talking about you guys and most of your rules uh, a lot of the historical games still use charts although I would say to a lesser extent but uh, most historical gamers even if they are using rules that don't use charts are kind of familiar with the charts now so here are some of kind of the the old school figures that were in a lot of the games these aren't a last one these are air figures you could probably still buy these uh, but I mean you look at a table like this Nobody, nobody would put this together now. Nobody's going to use this, right? And this is this is not a campaign. It says this is the chart by which the game is played. Without it, there can be no game. Look at this. So this is actually the game, the, the part that's needed for the game. And this is for actually an airborne game, which I may, I would prop, I might want to try to play that out with some of my boat action airborne. Says they came in like birds, Eben Mil. So he actually, and this is this is another thing that separated these old games from what you see today, 
So today when you get World War II rules or any kind of really rules, the the focus is on okay, we're gonna create rules for a period and then we're gonna do a scenario book or we're gonna do a supplement, right? Or we're going to do a codex or an army book. So you have the boat action model. You have boat action. And then whenever they go to another period, they boat on an extra rule. They take off a certain rule. Or they create a little supplement. Well, back in Donald Featherstone's in them day, they did rules for, for specific actions. So these are a set of rules to play Eben, Ema, Eben Emael. Right? Or Eben Emel. I'm not sure how you would pronounce that. But this is a set of rules to play. This particular battle has its own set of rules. Right? Its own set of rules. And that was actually quite common back in the early days of wargaming. Right? If you were playing Waterloo, you did a set of rules to play Waterloo. They weren't generic Napoleonic rules. I mean, they had generic Napoleonic rules, but it was more common to find than it is now. I mean, it was more common to find specific rules for specific battles or engagements, which a lot of times allowed you to feel or experience the period much better than you can with just a general set of rules where you bolt on a few little special, special options. Like you would never be able to put that whole chart that I showed you both that on to, to, to a game of boat action because most people wouldn't even know what they were looking at. But anyway, so this was kind of the book that started it all for me. Uh, and this was also back in the day, and I'm embarrassed to say this, when you actually read the rules. So like I would I would take a day and maybe I would start with chapter one Right, and if I got to page 17, when I came back the next day, I started with page 18. Right, and you would go through this until you, you read all of this. Right, nowadays, how long would it take somebody to read all of this? I, I haven't read all of this since I was, I was younger. Right, most people would just not read all of this. I'm not saying nobody, but I'm just saying most of us wouldn't. This is like 200 pages. I mean, it's not necessarily written to be read straight through, but, you know, if, if you wanted to do a Macedonian engagement, then you would obviously want to read this whole section, not just skim through the rules. And so, and remember I told you, I said back then it was a very serious affair. My man, these, my, my boys are gaming in suits and ties. Right? When have you ever seen that ever at a game convention nowadays? They are gaming in suits and ties. Now, you might say, well, you know, that had to be a tournament. No, this was down at the War Games Club. They're just at the club. My boys are in suits and ties, although it probably was a tournament because they do look like they have on badges and stuff. But, uh,. I like I like seeing the pictures of the old dudes. I, I might want to do that one day if I ever run a convention. I'll have a rule that nobody can play in the historical games without wearing a without wearing a suit and tie. You must have your suit and tie if you want to play in any other historical games across the table. And so I just wanted to introduce you to this. This is I think this is an amazing book. I mean this if you bought this. You would have everything you need to do miniature wargaming. I mean, there's enough gaming in this book to last you, I would say, at least four or five years, literally. He talks about collecting. He talks about the different periods. He gives some nice special rules. And this is actually the original cover, original dust cover, the original publication, David and Charles, Newton Abbott. Uh, this is not the John Curry version. Which I think is a, well, I think I know it's a soft cover. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little time on that. Just kind of sharing my, sharing my love for, for that publication and the author with you. But I'm going to move quicker with these. So here we have one of Donald Featherstone's probably still most valuable books. 
is solo wargaming. This and his book called Skirmish Wargaming are usually the ones that are going to cost you the most money if you get an original. I mean, you can buy the John Curry version for like 18 or 20 bucks. But some of the original copies of these, I mean, if you go to A Books, I mean, there's people asking for hundreds of dollars for some of these. Uh, so this is Solo Wargaming. And I'm, I'm very familiar with this book as well. This is kind of what I was talking about, about the Elastalin figures. Uh, and in this book, basically... Donald shares a whole range of options for, for playing a game solo. I mean, he talks about using chance cards, tactical cards, regimental cards. There's things in here about courier cards, the matchbox system in Solo War Game. And what's so funny is if you talk to people today, right? Because there's a lot of Solo War Gamers now, most of whom got into solo war gaming through solo board gaming right and they will say well i never even knew you could solo war game i had never heard of that you know until this this game came out with these rules or until i watched this guy's channel right and people are like well how do you solo war game i've never heard of that do you know this book was written in 1973 i was five years old i'm 55 now in 1973, Donald Featherstone was already talking about how to solo war game. And this is him stretched out across his table. I mean, that's his table for him playing his games. There's no mats. There's no there's no mouse pad mats there. Look, this guy has carved in terrain. I mean, I'm telling you, this stuff was a very serious affair. Look at the mathematics. Four times one to the third power equals a unit of 20 infantry plus two officers and 20 millimeter scale. I mean, this stuff was a, this was why this used to be known as a gentleman's hobby, right? It had nothing to do with societal level or your place in society when it was considered a gentleman's hobby. It was called a gentleman's hobby because it was a very serious undertaking, Right, you, there was there was math, there was history involved, there was uh, kind of like this this uh, reproduction and museum quality works. There were tables and charts. I mean, that's why it was called a gentleman's hobby. Had nothing to do with your place in society, nothing to do with your race or gender. It just had to do with this was a serious undertaking if you wanted to be a miniature wargaming. Right? You didn't just buy a set of rules and show up with some unpainted miniatures. You could not do that. Right? That was not allowed. Look at these tables. Right? And these are not these are not at conventions. These are in their homes. These are pictures from his home. I think he's I read in here that he got some of them from Jack Scrubby's home. This is Jack Scrubby right here. Perhaps the foremost American war game. And most people have never heard of Jack Scrubby. That's sad. He had excellent rules. Uh, I'm trying to think of was it he or the other one that did the whole high Hyborian campaign? Solo musket war game. The lonely war gamer plots a campaign. So this is Donald Featherstone sitting there with a real map, a real compass, working out a friggin' campaign. Right, and people don't engage in the hobby like that no more. Right, people don't don't commit or dedicate themselves to the hobby. You have a few people, uh, maybe in clubs and things, who will, who will, you know, maybe get a participation game that they will they will put that kind of attention into. But most people sitting at home, it's just easier to use somebody else's rules. It's easier to buy your terrain and throw a mat down. Right. Look at this. This stuff is sculpted, and most of this I can guarantee you because I've read his other books. Is paper mache. So there's like newspaper foil, and you know what they put. They put the paper over the foil, and then they paint it. I don't even think there's plaster in a lot of this because it made the boards too heavy. So you have you had this solo war game, and this has been out since 1973. Uh, 
So this publication is basically 60 years old. Now, this is also what I was talking about last night when I said Napoleonic games were pretty much very normal back in the early days of Wargaming. It was very, very normal to play Napoleonic games. And so this guy, Bruce Quarry, who is another luminary uh, in the, the miniature Wargaming field, uh, and I'm going to put a link to a video I did just basically talking about the luminaries in miniature wargaming. If you haven't seen that, if you're new to the channel, I think you'd enjoy it. It's only about 10 minutes. But I do go through Bruce Quarry, Jack Scrubby, Donald Featherstone. And so this is uh, Bruce Quarry's book on Napoleon War. Now this is actually dealing mostly with Napoleonic campaigns. This thing has 13 chapters. He starts out with the ingredients for your campaign, choosing painting and mounting figures. He gives the chronology of the Napoleonic Wars, recruiting and paying for an army. So right there, that is a part of most Napoleonic, mean, most miniature war games that is totally disappeared from the hobby. Nobody puts rules in there anymore for recruiting and paying for your army. They just tell you you've got so many points. Well, in this version, you have to have a kingdom, and your kingdom will determine what kind of army you can levy. Because you got to understand, in these games, it was not about both sides being equal, right? It was not about, oh, I get 100 points and you get 100 points. If this was the French against the Belgians, you know, the French would, might be vastly superior in many ways. And that was that was part of the hobby is you're going to re recreate this conflict even if it was asymmetrical this was published in 1977 so this came out about four years after Donald Featherstone did solo war gaming but they talk about organization your lines of communication medical services and prisoners of war nobody talks about that anymore Right when you do a campaign, attrition and desertion, generals and generalship, strategy and tactics, sieges. Who's ever played a Napoleonic war game siege? Weather, calendars, field engineering, and notes. Okay, and so you go through this book again, you're gonna have to like reading because there is a lot of reading. I think this is almost 200 pages. Uh, 192 now there's a picture insert here in the center which was common back in the day when they would do rules like this they would just throw most of your color pictures in the center of the book I mean and I'm telling you these 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 tables still hold up today some of these armies still hold up today I mean you can almost see the snow in this picture on the right you know on the left you you'd be forgiven if you thought that was an episode of Sharp's practice. I mean, and these look at the paint jobs on some of these miniatures. I mean, the uniforms and the things are just meticulously matched up and detailed. Let me see if I can turn the light on without. Oh, it's just too much gloss. Yeah, that's why I didn't I didn't put it on to begin with because it was it's too much gloss coming off of these glossy pages, but. I mean, this is a glorious book. You know, if I ever thought I could afford to retire, I think the day after I retired, I would start trying to put this campaign together. And you know what you could use? I think you could play this using some risk Napoleonic figures to base your armies up in, like in 15 millimeter scale. You could do massive armies. I've actually started buying old risk games and just pulling out those figures trying to see how many I can get in case I can ever do that with a Napoleonic game. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kind of modern wargaming authors. And we're going to talk about one that I'm sure everybody's heard of and one that most of you probably have not heard of. So the one everybody's heard of is obviously Joseph McCullough. This is his gothic horror game called Silver Bayonet. 
the one that most of you have not heard of is a guy named Neil Thomas, who I actually met at a uh, Gen Con convention. He was running some games out of one of his books. And so last night I told you, I said, there's an author out now who was putting out books back in the style of the old luminaries, like Donald Featherstone, Charles Grant. And that guy is Neil Thomas. I think right now he has about six books out. And let me see if they have in here when they... Because normally, sometimes they'll put a section that says, also from Neil Thomas. But I think this might have been his first book that was published by these guys, Sutton Publishing Limited. But I think he has this book out, which is called Wargaming and Introduction. I think he has one out on the Napoleonic era. I think he has one out on... Uh, this particularly, I think the medieval era, I think he may have a solo or no, I think it's a skirmish one also, but he has, if you look him up, he has right now probably five different books. And the thing that makes his books unique today is that his books are very much in the same style as Donald Featherstone and all of those kind of old school war gamers so he starts with a section on what is war gaming getting started he's talking about the napoleonics in here chariots and infantry ancient war games so this is definitely geared toward historical the crusades he puts some rules in here like there's some pike and shot rules uh i'm i don't think he well, he even has some charts. And this is what I'm talking about. You see that chart? Pikemen versus Pikemen. And so forth. Now, I think, unlike Featherstone, I think Featherstone's and them charts were more modifiers. I think his charts are kind of what you need to roll on your, on your dies. Your D6s or D10s. And he does tend to do a lot of... Uh, I think he does tend to do like a lot of just D6 or D10s. But he does have charts in here. You know, he has score required. So he does, I think he does, to the, for the most part, he tries to get, tries to eliminate charts. But they're still there. There's still a chart. So I don't see too many pictures in this. I think in some of his later books, oh, wait a minute. So he did what they did. He did a color section right in the center of the book. Right, if you go to the center of the book, and these are armies. I'm not sure if these are from his collection or if they're from other gamers' collections. But I will tell you, I mean, some of the some of the armies from the 70s we looked at, to me, look better than some of these. Which these are probably more more modern. Now, of course, when you get to the Napoleonics, they're always going to stand out. I mean, that's just, that's what the Napoleonic warfare gaming is about. It's just the colors, the splendor, the spectacle, the grandeur. But so he does, he has a whole color section in the middle of the book, just like we saw in uh, Donald Featherstone's book, or was that Bruce Quarry's book? But then let's compare that to Joseph McCullough. So basically, he introduces us to the silver bayonet. He says what you need to play. Selecting a nation, creating the officer, the stats. And so if you go to page 17, definitely has nice artwork. That's one thing that is kind of, I think that has been a plus to a lot of the modern war game publications is the inclusion of dedicated art. Because back in the old days, you almost never saw art, dedicated art, that where they hired an artist to, to illustrate parts of the book. That was not common back then. Uh, they might show you some old art from like the 18th century from a museum portrait of a battle, which I think was in some of the books we looked at. But you very, I don't think in any of the books that I see any dedicated art. So I will say that the presentation, the layout is actually much better in, in, the, in the modern books. You have to admit that they have 
kind of uh, blowouts, right? They, they, they organize a lot of the information so it's easier on the eyes and to read. But right here, we start to see the difference. Because you see here with Joseph McCullough, he's breaking this down uh, as far as, you know, a D6, a D10. I'm not exactly sure what he uses in this game. Probably the same system from Frostgrave, that same engine. And so a lot of this is just going to be D6s or D10s. You will not see any charts in here to resolve any combat. Right, and I, I've never read the rules, but I can guarantee you, you won't see the charge. But then again, there we go, the beautiful art, a veteran hunter. I like that. I like this. Where bear setting up the table. So we're already done with the rules. Look at that. Look at that. You're 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 basically 40 pages in, and I think that's the end of the rules, or at least those are the profiles. Because now we're looking at playing the game. Okay, no, here's the rules. Activation, movement. Oh, this almost looks like you could pull this out of the book. Clue markers. So it's a definitely a different type of rules writing. Right? I mean, there's little, there's little boxes here that blow out about... Every now and then they'll have some historical information in those boxes. But the majority of the rules is just mechanics. Whereas if we looked at the old school rules, and even a guy like Neil Thomas, you know, the majority of these rules are really going to discuss, are really going to discuss uh, the whole uniqueness. They're going to break down elements and armies and divisions so like this close order infantry all of this is dealing with close order infantry heavy cavalry special rules whereas this this type of book is more designed to give you a step-by-step -step, uh kind of hold your hand so that you can just start playing the game right there's not going to be a lot of information about and of course this is fantasy so, I mean, you know, I don't know how much history you're going to put in a fantasy game. We're at the back with the scenarios. I mean, I really do like the presentation in this game. You know, I'm not sure uh, if it plays differently enough from Frostgrave that I would, I would be interested in it. But the presentation is beautiful. And this is a gothic horror game, which I'm going to compare... To another gothic horror that I mentioned last night. So we're going to get rid of Neil Thomas for a minute. But we're going to leave Joseph McCullough's book here. Alright, so now we're kind of done with kind of the whole historical evolution of gaming and wargaming. Right? I just kind of wanted to give you a background on what miniature wargame rules used to look like. And what miniature wargame rules look like today. So now I want to kind of get into what I was discussing about certain genres like gothic horror, pirate rules, and things like that. So we have here Silver Bayonet by Joseph McCullough, which says here gothic horror, right, which is a specific genre. We have a gothic horror series here by West Wind Publications, but the name of the game is Vampire Wars which is a gothic horror game so in Joseph McCullough's rules as you saw you're going to kind of build up a team uh, select a nation and then you're going to start playing some scenarios uh, and I haven't read this all the way but let's just go to select a nation which is 14 because I think I, I'm going to show you something and this is something I talked about uh, so we have here selecting a nation Austria, Britain, France Prussia, Russia, Spain you know 18th century, 17th century nations well 18th century so then he talks about uniforms and then he goes from there to create an officer now, what is it that you notice immediately about this? 
And I'm going to give you a second. All right, time's up. What you will notice about this, if you if you are kind of familiar with Ruse, is there is no distinction in here based on what nation you selected. So basically, selecting why why do you select a nation other than what the color you're going to paint their uniforms? Because other than that, there's no distinction in here as far as what nation you selected. It says here. Your choice of nation influences which soldiers can be recruited into your unit. And so we haven't got to that yet. Uh, but I guess here, selecting soldiers. So Austria can get these soldiers. Britain can get those soldiers. And then you have a general soldier list. Which I kind of like. I'm not going to lie. I do like that it, it kind of, you can select soldiers based on your nation. Uh... And obviously, all of the soldiers have unique skills or abilities. But let's look at how how Vampire Wars does it. Because I'm not I'm not criticizing Silver Bayonet and how Joseph McCullough does it. But I think what what Joseph McCullough does is he kind of streamlines your nation. Basically, select a nation, and then from that point on, this is the soldiers you can select. So Gothic Horror is the same ideal. Right, you are going after these creatures, and you are hunters assigned to a particular nation. Right, so you got the opening with the rules, and obviously the presentation in this is a lot skimpier. The art is very line, just line drawings. So I mean, West Wind Productions, as far as I know, is kind of a house shop. They they're not, they weren't very large. And I don't think they are very large, if, even if, if they're still still producing stuff. What's the copyright on here? Uh, West Wind Productions. Blah, blah, blah. Stephen Lawrence. I'm, I'm familiar with Stephen Lawrence's stuff. I did not know he did this. I really... I talked about Stephen Lawrence's... I think it was his Western Ruse. Okay, I don't see the copyright, but I think this this may be from 1990 or so, if I remember. So, I'm going to show you what Gothic Horror does. So, in Gothic Horror... You will select your nation, but then your nation not only determines what soldiers you get, but it also determines what special abilities your nation has. So, like, every nation has certain unique abilities and certain unique weapons. So, you have the Vatican Hit Squad, as he calls it. That is a nation... You have the Teutonic Order. You have the Templars. You have the Hospitallers. You have the Local Polizei. The Gypsies. And there's more than that. Let's see. So I might have went past. Because I think they also had like the the Zendari. Oh no, you have the Wolf and Jaegers. Wolf Hunters. The American Vampire Hunters. You have the Frankish Vampire Hunters. The English Vampire Hunters. <coughs> A lot of Vampire Hunters. The Zendarian Vampire Hunters. The Hungarian Vampire Hunters. And the Van Helsing Vampire Hunters. And all of them have their own kind of unique abilities for each each faction. They have their own kind of soldiers or figures. And they have their own types of weapons that they can use. Right? And this is this is Gothic Horror. But I mean most people have not played these. Right? Most people I doubt if most people have even played a Gothic Horror before Silver Bayonet came out. I mean they might have played Arkham Horror. But that's kind of modern 
That's like a modern gothic horror game. These are your kind of your 18th century ones. So that quickly brings us to medieval stuff. And I was telling you guys yesterday, I said, well, most people couldn't name a medieval set of rules right off the top of their head. Uh, you know, pretty much ever since Warhammer Fantasy Battle disappeared. Now that might not be true because I did forget about Sword Point. And I think there's like a Sword Point 2.0 now, which I think this was actually pretty popular. I think it did go to Kickstarter and did well. I told you guys about Nevermind the Bill Hooks. And this was a free free uh, insert. And really, if you want to play medieval games, this is all you need. This is actually a very good system by a guy named Andy Callen, who I kind of consider from the mode of the old school old school war gamers. I don't know if he really uses tables in here. Uh, there's a table for the points. But he, he kind of breaks it into a into D6 rows and stuff. Which nowadays you almost have to do that if you want something for general consumption. But he has a much more deluxe version of this now. Uh, a much more deluxe version. But you can get by just with this. If you can find the issue that this was given, given out in free uh, in War Games Illustrated. But this here has got to be my, I want to say my favorite medieval war game set of rules, but I, I guess I really can't say it's my favorite because I've only played it once or twice at some conventions. But this is called Tactica, which is ancient war gaming. But there's one called Tactica Medieval, which actually covers the medieval war game. And I couldn't find it, so I just grabbed this one. But the Tactica system is by a guy named Artie Conliffe. It kind of basically involves bases and moving your bases and uh, things like that. It, 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 it harkens back to old school rules with kind of the charts. Uh, you will see some charts in here, but I'm not sure if, if most of the charts are for resolving the battles or just creating your units and their thing. Look at these pictures, man. Look at just, look at the spectacle. And this is not a very big supplement. Now this is actually only a supplement. So you would need the rules called Tactica. And then this is supplement book one, which is basically army list for the ancient period. Periods which, you know, a lot of people don't play anymore. Uh, it says here, Arminian, uh, Late Roman, Early Gothic, Han, Sassanid, Persian, Late Byzantine, Bogar, Arab Empire, Lombard, Saxon, Viking, Norman, Sumerian, Mongol, and so forth. And I think these rules must have came out probably around 86 or 80, maybe 88 as well. I don't see a copyright on here. And I never knew so many people wrote rules. Oh, copyright 1990. So these came out in 1990. You can still find people playing this at conventions. But, and I am not familiar with Sword Point. I mean, I've heard of Sword Point. It says it's written by Martin Gibbons. Uh, all the models in here are Gripping Beast. So it talks about playing the game, setting up the game. There's a chart for basing your figures, winning the game, special rules, converting hits to kills, uh, your table, your scenarios. It's a couple of charts here and there cohesion test so I am like I said I am not familiar with these rules like I said I have heard I've heard that they're that they're 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 good rules they're a good set of rules uh this is your your kind of your reference section your modifiers but this is kind of a a dice based thing I mean you're going to you're going to be rolling a lot of dice uh 
We've got some army lists. And most of this army list just seems like this is the units that are available to you. I don't really see any special rules for the armies. Other than I guess the units probably have their own special rules. But this says ancient and medieval. But I just wanted to kind of show you guys kind of the range. If you're looking at trying to do medieval or ancient war gaming. You know this is kind of the range that things fall in today. You know, you have a set of rules like Tactica, which are really kind of going to be just mass bases and kind of set up more familiar with kind of the Old Wars gaming. You have Sword Point, which I would place in the middle. Right, this is, this is, I mean, I think this is a serious uh, ancient slash medieval game, but it, it has been kind of streamlined. And then you have never mind the bill hooks, which is basically a a quick version of a medieval game. How you can play a quick medieval game uh, and have you know resolve it in a night, basically. All right, and so the last two I want to talk about tonight, and I'm not going to get around to any hobbying, so I apologize if that's what you showed up for is Warhammer Ancient Battles and this book here called Piquet or Piquet Picket uh Band of Brothers 1200 to 1600 AD uh I think everybody's familiar with Warhammer Ancient Battles even if you got into Warhammer late I think at some point somebody would have mentioned this set of rules. This was written actually by the guys at Games Workshop who wanted to do some they wanted to do some uh, historical games pretty much using the Warhammer rules. And that's basically exactly what this is. You do see the charts but these are actually the same charts that were in the original Warhammer Fantasy rules. Right? To be honest with you, this was the charts. Uh, but what they were able to do was basically take that set of rules and I would say uh, place them in a historical context which was believable. Right, so that you could get believable historical results using those using those rules. And they did that a lot of times through special rules, by adding special units, uh, and through the scenarios. But I mean you just see here this is just lovely miniatures. Uh and these were not Games Workshop miniatures, right? So these were not, these are not GW. You could not buy these from GW. I don't think they really give credit to the miniature, whoever the miniatures belong to, because obviously I guess GW might not have liked that. That might have been a, a bridge too far. But they do show you the results you can achieve with your miniatures. Talk about doing banners. and Basically, this is Warhammer Fantasy Battle in a historical setting. And they did a whole bunch of supplements. They did the Ancient Battles. They wound up doing... They did an El Cid supplement. They did a Western supplement. A Pirate supplement. A Medieval or Crusader supplement. I mean, I think they almost got to everything before this 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 ran its course. They did a World War One supplement. I think the only period they never did was actually World War Two. Believe it or not, they did a World War One supplement, but they never did World War Two. I think they skipped past World War Two, and they skipped past Napoleon Napoleonics. But they did Western. They did pirates. They did Medieval, they did El Cid, they did Ancient, uh, yeah, and they did a lot of stuff kind of in the middle of that, uh, you know, kind of between Ancients and, 
and uh, Medieval, they, they did a lot of uh, other supplements, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Like, I think there was one on uh, Constantinople or during that era. Uh, like I said, they did one for El Cid, one for the Crusades, and they did a Siege one, too, which I have. These are very expensive. This one, not this one so much. You can get the core base game. This one will run you about $30. But, like, if you're trying to get the Western version and the supplements that were done for the Western version, you could pay easily $100 per book. I mean, they had, uh, I think it was called Legends of the West, Showdown, uh, and then they had another one. I think was like a Indians or Calvary and Indians. I mean, those would run you a hundred bucks each. This is what I was talking about last night with war games that have become vintage. Now, on the other end of that is this set called Pickett Band of Brothers. And when I was, I was, you know, almost predominantly medieval. This was a very highly thought of, very well known set of rules, which most people haven't heard of. These go back to 205. So, I don't know. I think this, this might be a reprint because I think there was another version before this one in a different format. But these rules were interesting because as I remember them, there was kind of like a dial or something that came with these rules. Like where you would, you would kind of, I think it was called your impetus or something that was kind of on a dial. But you have a lot of army lists in here. A lot of missile firing in here. And now Piquette, the Piquette rules are actually, I think, for ancients. But the Band of Brothers brings them into the medieval era. But these, these rules are very, very meticulously prepared. So you have very detailed, broken down army lists of just all kinds of different armies in Western Europe, Wars of the Reformation, uh, the Rajputs, I don't know what that is, the Afghans, the Mughals. So I mean, they, they went from the beginning to the end, the Papal States, Venice, master list for the last Plantagenets, the Low Countries, Twilight of Chivalry. So I mean, these are this is a huge book of army lists. If you can think of some type of army that existed during the medieval and the early Renaissance period, there is probably a list in here for it that you can use to play this set of rules. Yeah, and this almost looks like this is almost all all lists. I mean, almost the whole book is list. I think there is actually another set that that gives the specific rules, although the rules are in here. Uh, for the for the medieval period, and this actually uses a uh, a hierarchy of dice system. So you have D four, D sixty eight, the quality dice. That's what they call it. Melee qualifications table, whether you can melee, melee fire table. So you definitely have your charts. You know, point blank range, short uh, movements on road and column. Formed, non-formed states of your unit. And so like where it says down one, that means your die would go down from a D6 to like a D4. Right, and so that's what the table would tell you if you're gonna go up or down, depending on what's going on. So you see here, this is a retinue of knights with heavy lance. They get three hits. Heavy, their AQ is heavy. For melee, they go up four Mor morale. There's no change. So. Yeah, but I just wanted to show you guys that. I just thought it might be helpful 
to a lot of people uh, because I think one of the things I may talk about in one of my uh, sessions this month you know, it's almost getting to the point now where there's really nothing new in the hobby you know, you're starting to get a lot of stuff that's being regurgitated you're starting to get a lot of stuff that is getting very old or long in the tooth you know it's just out there out there you know dead zone 5.0 all of this kind of stuff kings of war 9.3 and it just goes back to what i said when i started this you know maybe it's time we stop trying to look forward for the new shiny thing you know one page rules and maybe it's time we go back right and we start to bring some of the depth and the sophistication back into our hobby and maybe you might just get a little more enjoyment out of it that way, right? These are not one-page rules, right? This is not one-page rules, right? There's a spectrum. There's a spectrum. But one-page rules does not fall anywhere on that spectrum, just to be honest with you, right? One-page rules is literally if you just want to play a game. Sit down on the floor take out your toys and play a game these are rules to simulate battles and warfares for a lot of ancient periods throughout the years right so none of these none of these publications are ever going to be accused of being one page rules and there's nothing wrong with that like, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, read. Just just read. Just try it. And I, I really think you will you will get a greater appreciation for the games that you do play. Right? The, 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 it will add a bit of sophistication to your games. So maybe you won't be so anxious to always run to the new thing because you're bored. Right, you're bored. So what are you gonna play next? Index card rules? You go from one page rules to index cards? You know, maybe it's time to go back. Right? Buy one of these books and actually read it and see if you can actually play the games that are in here. There's plenty of rules, plenty of information to walk you through it if you're willing to just read. So I don't know guys, I hope this helps some of you. I hope it at least gives you things to think about. You know, maybe you will go on Amazon and just order one of these and try reading it and seeing, you know, maybe there were things in there, you know, that you never knew that, that you could try or you could do or I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's sad that, that we're going to throw away so much history, so much of people's lives. And experience that they invested in writing and putting this stuff out for us you know that we're just supposed to sweep all this under the rug and just play with one page rules and I mean that was not what I started this about to, to get onto the whole one page rules thing but you know it all kind of goes together right it all kind of ties in with each other Right, because if all you're willing to look at or do is play one page rules, then none of this has any relevance to you. It has zero relevance to you. This is not for war gamers, miniature war gamers, tabletop war gamers who are looking for one page rules. But it is for war gamers, miniature war gamers, and tabletop war gamers who really want to think about their hobby, who really want to engage with their hobby at a more intellectual level, right? They want, they want to get some intellectual stimulation out of the hobby and not just some uh, personal gratification that my army cleans your army off the table in 15 minutes. <laughs> Okay, these games, you were not going to be beating anybody in 15 minutes. I can guarantee you that. Even if, even in the asymmetrical games, 
Nobody's going to win that game in 15 minutes because of the thought that went into the periods and the armies and the scenarios. Right? That is why you saw Donald Featherstone sitting at that chart with his map out and his little compass out, right? Marking out the campaign. Because there's thought that goes into this. Right? There's there's, there's some there's some intellectual thought that goes into these into these games. And all I'm saying is we have a lot of people in the past who spent a lot of time to share that with us. And we still have people today who are spending time to try to reintroduce it to us. Right? And so all I say is maybe, maybe, maybe just take a minute and look and read and see what came before. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. I will see you tomorrow. We will be back on the hobby table. Take care. Good night. And God bless. Mm -hmm.